I'm used to having a podium that I can hide behind, so I don't have it here and I'm a little bit uncomfortable, but I'll do my best. So I work for an outfit called Northwest Capital. Uh, we, we try and, I call us merchant engineers, we try and dream up things that we think are missing or we find something that's broken and we fix it. So we think we can do anything. I don't know what, what happened there, that would happen by itself. So our proprietary advantage is there's only five of us that work there. There's uh, four of us and a dog. Dog's the chief enthusiasm officer. The rest of us are experts in something. Some of the things we've done are on the pictures on the right there. So that used to be the fourth largest gas plant in Canada. We bought it, made it to 750 million a day and 60,000 barrels of liquids. So a decent sized plant. Uh, Calfrac is the next one down. Big country energy services that would have about a thousand people in it. We start these things from scratch. Like we're, you know, we're trying to figure them out right from the get go. Uh, we used to own the world's largest deep water drilling rig. We bought it out of a bankruptcy in uh, Pascagoula, hauled it up to Halifax, completed construction, and then drilled for a couple of years and then sold it. When they work, I lose interest. I don't like, I like getting them going, I like fixing them, and I like seeing them run, then I disappear. The bottom one is the Dakota gasification. That was a, a plant that makes the CO2 for the Weyburn project in Saskatchewan. We did some work down there and uh, they, just, they were happy with the work, so we bought 11% of it back in the day. So I, we sold everything about 20 years ago and I started thinking, I've been hearing about diversification in Alberta my whole life. I got sick of hearing it and I decided I wanted to do something about it. So this is a flow sheet for a refinery that I drew and uh, that's what it looks like today. So we spent about $12 billion out there, uh, worked about 75 million man hours of labor. It's the first refinery in the world that was designed from inception to do carbon capture. So we capture about 4,000 tons a day. Uh, at the same time we were doing that, we had the idea, you gotta do something with the carbon. Alberta, if you see that sort of cloud looking thing in the center there, that's central Alberta. There's uh, about a billion barrels of oil to get out of the ground using CO2 in that area and we can put about 10 billion tons of CO2 in the depleted gas reservoirs there. So I thought that was a good place to start building CO2 infrastructure. Uh, I had the memory in my mind, my dad bought me these shares in 1957, this is the Alberta gas trunk line, so every Albertan got to buy some of these shares, I think it was 20 shares each, so my dad bought them for me, and I still got them, I still got the derivative of those shares today. Uh, so. I had the idea when we were building trunk line, this is what's gonna happen. So this is the, we built the Alberta carbon trunk line, we call it. I called it that because I was thinking about Alberta gas trunk line. And this is the growth of gas trunk line over the years. So I felt the same thing could happen with carbon trunk line in Alberta. We'd eventually end up at every industrial facility in the place. So that's what it looks like today. We built the first leg of that, cost about a billion two to build a pipe down. The pipe has an installed capacity of 15 million metric tons a year which makes it the largest project for anthropogenic in the world by far. And the rest of that stuff is just stuff we had to do to get it there. So I tell people I've been doing this a long time. That's the way I used to look when I started on this stuff. <laughs> so of course, the new flavor of the month is data centers. Everybody's talking about data centers all the time. They're gonna take over the world. There's been talk of 51 gigawatt data centers in North America, so everybody's talking about it. Uh, and it's interesting, it's a flavor of the month. And so we've worked a lot in carbon sequestration, that's a flavor of the month. We've worked a lot in hydrogen, that's another flavor of the month. And now data centers are the flavor of the month. So I'm gonna tell you why they all fit together and we have three flavors of the month in one thing. So we started by looking, what, what if you build one of these things in Texas? And so they say they need one gigawatt. I think this is gonna happen not one gigawatt at a time, it'll happen 50 megawatts or so at a time. But Everybody's talking about one gigawatt, so that's what I did the numbers on. Texas is hot. It's a lot hotter than Alberta. And you have to make cooling for these things. So when you have one gigawatt of compute, you need the, every, 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 every watt you put in turns into a watt of cooling you need on the back end. And when you're in a hot place, it's expensive to do that. So when you gross all that up with the line losses, you get to about 1.8 gigawatts of electricity if you want one gigawatt of compute. The land area is enormous, so people want to use as much solar and wind as they can. They can't use all solar and wind because the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time, so they always have to be backed up with a lot of gas. But to put the solar they need in, is a, solar and wind, is 170 kilometers, square kilometers of area you need to supply the, one of these things. So that's quite a bit. And then the CO2 emissions are enormous. They're, you know, for the missing 
wind and solar, you need to fly it with gas. The missing emissions are 5.3 megatons a year. That's big. So everybody's announcing all these things, and it brings back a memory that I had when I was building the refinery. Lots of people were talking about building refineries in the same place as I was, and they, uh, they were all bigger than me, and they all spent way more money than I did. They all spent, all the people on this list stopped, except for the one where the red arrow is, that's me, and they all spent at least 100 million bucks getting to know. So our proprietary advantage is there's only five of us in our office, the dog doesn't get to vote, and we can decide to do stuff, and then we just go ahead and do it, and you know, we have to keep iterating until we get to the end. So I think Alberta is the best place to build data centers. I want to tell you why. First thing is, it's, it's, it's development friendly here. So on the left is the carbon trunk line. It was 250 kilometers long. We had to consult with 353 different landowners. 350 of them said, this is great. You mean you guys are going to pay me every year to go across my property? Three guys didn't like the idea of it. We went around them. And so you can do things like this Alberta that are big scale. You don't get a lot of pushback. The buses on the other one are the refinery site. We had 7,000 people out there. There was a lot of traffic and a lot of problems. We had 100 buses a day going. No one complained about it. They wanted the activity there, and that's, I think, what's typical of Alberta. The other thing about why to do it in Alberta, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more certain. We've got, we, we know the permitting system, we know it works. Fiber optics are everywhere. It's low carbon today if we do it right, and it's low cost and a proven option on the future of carbon neutrality. So what I want to do is build at existing gas plants in the foothills, and the reason I want to do that is we're going to disconnect from the grid. We, we think that we can achieve the necessary reliability, and I'll tell you a bit about that in a sec. Uh, we are also going to do heat integration, so there's a lot of waste heat at the gas plant. And that waste heat is valuable. It's too valuable to waste, and we can use that to generate the cooling we need for the data center. So you save grid charges. In Alberta, that's about 42 bucks a megawatt hour. So today, it's almost half the electricity price is grid distribution charges. Uh, you save the time to get a connection. So that when you show up at the ASO and say, I want a gigawatt connection, that's big news, and it takes a while for them to think about that. We get a free 100 megawatts of cooling out of the waste heat, and we reduce the CO2 by about, I don't know, 350,000 tons a year. So these are the prices. The one on the left is if you're grid connected, and the things down below are the carbon intensity. So you know we're, we're looking, we're, we're shooting for the carbon, low in carbon intensity and lowest price we can get. We think we can get to 60 bucks a megawatt or megawatt hour by being heat integrated at an existing sour gas plant. That should be big news in the data center world. So people talk about reliability, how you get it. We've done a bunch of study work on this. And we can get to the, the reliability that is needed if we have dual gas supplies at the plant and then dual other stuff. So this is the kind of plant we're going to build. We take heat from the gas plant, take heat from the power plant, make it into cooling, send it to the data center. And we've got an, ex, an extra Nova connection. So at all of these plants, there's a Nova connection. We can reverse that and get gas if the plant goes down. So do it faster in Alberta. No grid connection needed. There's a lot of latency when you talk to the ASO about these sizes of connections. Second thing is always, you know, these things all need water. Water scarce everywhere in southern Alberta. Water scarce. You, it's hard to get. At the existing gas plant connections, many of them were much bigger than they are today, but they still got the old water license. So the water is available at the right sites. Uh, lots of land there, no, no land restrictions, existing infrastructure, so there's lots of things, office building, maintenance building, uh, some of the equipment can be repurposed, water treatment plant, wastewater treatment plant, boiler feed water, all of that stuff is there today, you can reuse it. And then the permits are easier at a brownfield site, and there's skilled people, so people forget most of the operating a data center is the process operators. I need a guy to run the air conditioning system. Those are people that work in gas plants. And I think the people that are coming here don't realize how deep the experience pool is at our gas processing business. That's where the people live. They don't live in Calgary. If you try and find a process operator in Calgary, you're looking hard. You find one and try and find one in Caroline, it's going to be easy. And then the people want you there. They're not fighting with you and telling you you can't do this stuff. They want you to do it. So that's what it looks like, gas plant on the left, power plant in the middle there, and then the data center down at the end. People, you know, talk about how do you, how have the data center guys been solving the carbon problem? They buy these pieces of paper. 
So if my windmill runs at night, I generate a renewable energy certificate. If it doesn't run in the day, that doesn't matter. I generated some certificates at night. Then I, the data center runs all the time. So I take that certificate that's from the wrong time of day, and I say, oh, well, I've got zero emissions. No, you don't. You're buying gas-fired power when the windmill isn't running, and you're buying one of these pieces of paper to offset that. So I think that time's going to end, and, and I'm, that's why I put the green washer machine up there. <laughs> so I think we're going to a world where we need physical compliance, and that's what this is. So that's a system that we built that puts the CO2 in the reservoir at, uh, near Red Deer. And uh, that's the CO2 coming out of there. We were doing the test, and that, that was a big day because the CO2 came down from the refinery. But we measure what we do. We link these things. When we know if we need power here, and we need CO2 sequestration there, we know we did it. So we save the cooling electricity. We're off grid. We got cheap power. It's the lowest CI because it's the most modern gas plant. It's heat integrated, so we get 300 megawatts from that and we get an option on carbon neutrality at a reasonable cost, and I'm gonna tell you about that now. So what we plan to do to achieve carbon neutrality is we're gonna take scrap wood, we're gonna put it in a wood gasification plant, I know this will sound spooky, but we know how to do it, and we're gonna take the hydrogen that comes out of that process and blend it with the natural gas and put the carbon underground. So the carbon that was in the wood ends up being underground, the hydrogen that comes out is carbon negative. And so when we blend that with natural gas, we buy down the carbon intensity of the natural gas. So that's sort of a little schematic of it. Tree takes the CO2 out of the air. We take that, that wood that has this air CO2 in, put it in the gasifier, we make it into hydrogen, and we take the CO2 that was in the air and from the trees and put it underground. So, you know, that block diagram looks pretty simple. This is the last one of the weeds things we built. This is the, the largest blue hydrogen plant in the world. We built it, that's a gasification island like we're gonna do for the wood. It's a close relative, the wood isn't quite the same, but it's pretty close. We spent about a billion dollars building that thing, so we know how to do this, and when we bought it, it didn't work. So we had to fix it ourselves, so you know, we had more than four guys in our office then when we were fixing the thing. The dog wasn't any good fixing these things. <laughs> So that's what we're gonna do. It's the same diagram as before, but a little bit different. So Alberta has really significant advantages on doing this. We have a tier system in Alberta that taxes the large emitters here. If they emit over 100,000 tons a year, they get taxed. You can make credits by sequestering CO2. So we, we have a revenue source from those credits. There's a single pore space in Alberta. So if you're doing pure CCS, you know you're dealing with the poor space owner of the Alberta government. If you're in Texas and you're on, on land, you can't do that because each individual landowner owns to the center of the earth. So you gotta fight with whoever big the thing is, you gotta fight with everybody in that area about whether they want you to do it or not. Here we have an experienced regulator, we've got evolved regulations, we know what to do, we know what the rules are, and then we have storage alternatives for CO2. So there are three ways to do it. Pure CCS, that's down in the prehistoric ocean that no one's ever put anything into before, but everybody's saying you can do it. I'm a little bit skeptical of that, but I'm old. Second place you can put them is depleted gas reservoirs. You know gas was in there, and so you can put some other kind of gas or some other kind of liquid and be pretty sure it's not gonna come out. And then EOR, when you put a barrel, of, when you put a ton of CO2 and you get two barrels of oil back. So it helps pay for the system. If you do this in the other order from the bottom up, then you, the system is building and being paid for without a bunch of subsidies. And I think the green world is cracking in some ways and the amount of subsidies are not gonna be as plentiful as they've been proposed. So people say, where are you gonna get the wood for this thing? And so I say we made 60 uh, megatons of feedstock last year when we had the fires. This wood goes into a gasifier, the carbon's still in it. If you let it sit there, it will decay and return that carbon to the atmosphere but we can go and grind it up and put it in the gasifier and sequester the CO2. So I don't know why you would ever waste the work of the tree. The tree's the best air capturing machine in the world. It's been around for 200 million years. It works, it doesn't need any energy, and it doesn't need any water. All the rest of these machines are science experiments and they need water and energy to run, and it's expensive. So this is what happens, in the, I've added the green bar on the right there. If you achieve the, the current level of federal CFS tax, 
and federal level of ITC support, you're in the solid green land. So we're 84 bucks a megawatt hour. We think those things are at risk right now, and, and you know who knows how the election's going to turn out. But w we're assuming that you've got to live in the solid green bar world. Can you get that to work? So that's, that we're hopeful that it's not, but if it is, we can work there. So that's what it looks like. Uh, that's the hydrogen plant on the end there. We know a lot about hydrogen, and we're absolutely convinced this is something that we can do. There is a proven plant operating in Norway, so we've gone and visited that plant, and so. We, it's not the plant we would build, but we've seen one run. Uh, so there's lots of places to do that. Those black dots are places to do it in Alberta. We've tied up a few of them right now, and we're in the process. We, you know, we're looking around trying to figure out where the best ones, and then try and work with the owner of the plant to, to do what we're proposing there. Uh, any producer in Alberta could supply gas because we're on the system, so it doesn't have to be coming from the gas plant or come from the gas plant and the Nova system close to fiber, close to CCS reservoirs. Most of these plants that we're looking for have depleted sour gas reservoirs and we can put CO2 back into them and they're absolutely secure storage containers. They've been there for at least 10 million years. So, and then there's proximity to skilled labor base. So all the process operators, all the things we need to run one of these and most of the things we need to build them are already resident there. So Texas or Alberta, those are the numbers. I pick Alberta. Of course, I'm from here and biased. Uh, so that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, it's a new inside market. Alberta should love this. It's a new inside gas market for Alberta. We're going to defer, extend these. These industrial sites have value. They, you know, they're, they're a gas plant, but they have the industrial value. They're worth something you know, just because of their industrial attributes and the brown feed things that come with them. So we think they, they're too valuable an asset to, to take down. They should be repurposed. Uh, we're going to increase lots of indigenous jobs in these things because there's a huge effort in collecting and processing the, the feedstock for the hydrogen part of it. And we think that's a job that is, people can do. They're doing that today. So we can sort of give them more work to do. And then the final, final thing is we take advantage of Alberta's CO2 advantages, which I think are unique in the world. So when you start doing this stuff, there's always some guy like that sitting around saying, too complicated, I don't like this, and all that stuff. When I was little, that's my mom, and when I was little, some guy was telling me that stuff. He's saying, you can't do that. My mom comes over and she says, he's talking about himself. He's not talking about you. <laughs> so that's the story. We can do it. Give me a chance. <laughs> Thank you.